Welcome to South Point Church Online, wherever you might be today. And if this happens to be your first time, we hope to see you again. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Matt, and I'm part of the team here at South Point. Hey, I wanna start right off today by saying why it might be important for every single person watching to stick around today. And it's because science and statistics tell us this truth that I'm gonna put up on the screen that applies to all of us, and it's this right here. All of us, all of us, you, me, we, all of us will have someone we care about face an issue surrounded by shame, stigma, and our response will either help or hurt. Did you catch that? Science and statistics tells us that you, that I, that we will have someone that we know and care about and that our response to this issue that they face will either help them or hurt them. And this comes through studies and researches and leads to statistics this morning that you may or may not have seen. I'm gonna put it up on the screen, it's this. Every year here in America, one in five people will have a diagnosable mental disorder. I mean, you already know this, that each and every single one of us here today will know someone that we care about at some point in our life that will be dealing with a mental health issue. It might be a mental health issue, it might be a mental health disorder, it might be a mental illness. But the stats say every year, one in five Americans. And listen, it might, and this is gonna surprise you, this person that you know and care about that might be dealing with a mental health issue might end up being you. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. It might be an immediate family member, like a spouse or like a child. And I wanna stop and I just wanna ask everyone to pause and take a quick second. Listen, I get here in America that we value physical health. I get that here in America we value financial health and that we want our kids to be in sports and, and that we want people to be physically well. But do you know that our mental health is really important? And here's gonna be our thing. Maybe one of those people that we care about could be a spouse or a child. For others of us, it might be an adult parent who is going through something. Maybe for others of us, it might be a sibling, a brother, or a sister. Or it might not be a family member, it might be a really good friend, someone that we know and care about, and we never saw it coming, and they never saw it coming, but all of a sudden, they're dealing with something that they didn't expect. It might even be a coworker. You know, someone you go to work with, your friends, you hang out, and something happens in their life. Statistics tell us that, that as we go through life, that each and every single one of us will know someone that is dealing with a mental issue. And listen, here's the truth that applies to each and every single one of us today, regardless of where you're at with Jesus. Listen, if you showed up today and you're kind of unsure about Jesus, maybe you didn't even talk about Jesus growing up, or maybe you even were a follower of Jesus since you were a little kid. Here's what we know to be true. Each and every single one of us will know someone and care about someone who at some point in their life will face a mental health issue. And so here's what we hope to do today, is we're gonna talk about some important things, but here's why this is so important. And so if you've got your coffee, your kids in the background, here's where you kinda wanna lean in. Here's why this is so important, because our view about mental health, our view will determine our response. And when someone we know and someone we care about deals with a mental health issue, our response will do one of two things. Our response based on our view will either add to the stigma and to the silence or to the shame, or our view will lead to the response of compassion, care, and support. And if we know them and we care about them, we would never want our view to lead or to add to the stigma, silence, and shame. We'd always want it to be about care, compassion, and support. So today, what we want to do is we want to look at some real life issues where there are some clinical issues that people that we care about may actually encounter through their lifetime. And we're actually going to put these on the screen. And I bet when I put these up on the screen that you'll immediately go, oh, I know someone that may deal with that. I know someone who is walking through that. And here's what they are. We're going to put them up on the screen. It's this, anxiety, depression, eating disorders, bipolar, PTSD, and schizophrenia. 
If I was honest, I could remove everyone that I know from my church world and just with my friends and just with family, I know someone with each one of these mental health issues. And that's not even including in church. And I bet you do too. And if I was really honest, I have some friends and some family members and people who attend who deal with multiple of these issues in their life. And the question that you ask and the question that we all ask is, well, why? Why do people have to deal with these things? And you know what? I'm not a clinical psychologist or a cyn- clinical psychiatrist. I- I'm not, a, you know, a, a, a degreed counselor. Um, but there are some things that I've learned that are core to why people might encounter these things. And there are tons more beyond what I'm gonna give you today, but I think it's really wise for us to understand why some of these things happen in people's lives. And we're gonna put them up on the screen. And here's the first thing that we need to understand, that sometimes it's physical. Sometimes our bodies have physical malfunctions in our brain, in other areas of our body that can lead to any one of these mental health issues that people may face. It actually might be a physical malfunction where our body doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Or it could be physiologically. And what that means is that there's a chemical imbalance or there's a hormonal imbalance or there's a chemical missing or something's not working right in the biochemistry or the physiology of our bodies. And so that the things that go on in our mind and our emotions and our feelings don't work the way they're supposed to. Sometimes it's hereditary. I know this is true in my family. As I look at my family tree on both my biological dad and my biological mom, and then my current immediate family, I can see generation from generation where something happened and some gene got turned on where there's mental health um, illnesses that have been passed down from generation to generation. It's hereditary. Another reason is trauma and there's all kinds of trauma. And I wanna gently suggest that all trauma is trauma to someone, and comparing trauma never actually helps anyone. That sometimes we may get any one of these things, and there's things not on this list that could be a result of trauma. And then environment. Environment could be a ton of different things. It could be a toxic environment. It could be a rapid change environment. It could be a harmful environment that may include trauma. And these are just some of the things. And here's the complex nature of all these mental health issues, disorders, and illnesses. And there are many more, is that sometimes the cause is one of those things, but sometimes the cause could be multiple. And sometimes the cause might not even be on this list. And you and I are not alone on asking, why do people suffer or deal with anxiety or depression or eating disorders or bipolar or PTSD or schizophrenia? Did you know that science has been asking this question? And I wanna share a really cool brain scan from the Mayo Clinic. I'm gonna put it up on the screen. And what it does is it shows one brain scan of someone who is suffering with major depression, and then the other brain scan is of a healthy person who is not dealing with major depression and you can see the difference. In the last 20 years, science has and the ability to see inside the brain without having to do surgery, so there's been so many advances that science has discovered that mental disorders are not weaknesses, they are illnesses. Now I wanna stop and I wanna shout this to the back row. I wanna make sure that everyone who watches this understands this truth. Mental disorders, mental illnesses are not weaknesses, they are illnesses. There is a ton of research that is continuing to go on to let us know that there are things that go on in our physical minds and in the biochemistry of our body that when trauma environments and things happen, it can literally alter our brain. And here's what's amazing. As science begins to take a look and understand that mental illness, mental disorders, and mental health isn't a weakness issue, it's a wellness or illness issue, that there are so many things like our mind and neuroplasticity and the biochemistry and how all those things are integrated. And here's what's amazing about as science begins to do research in discovering that mental disorders, mental illness, and even mental wellness is not a weakness issue, it's an illness issue. And here's where it gets a little bit crazy. 
Science is beginning to let us know a truth. Yet somehow in most, not all, but in most of culture and most of church, not all, but in most of church, the response to mental health, mental disorders, and mental illness, or the whole topic of mental wellness in culture and in the church is still responding with stigma, silence, and shame. And it's so important that we address this because each and every single one of us, regardless of where we're at in our faith, will know and care about someone. And our response will either add to that stigma and shame or we will provide compassion and support. And it leads us needing to ask an important question that every single one of us needs to be able to answer today. And I'm gonna put this question up that we're gonna address today and it's this right here. How does our view of mental health need to change so our responses offer support instead of shame and stigma. We need to ask the question, is our view one that leads to compassion and care and support, or is our view, does it somehow give silence or stigma or shame? And it really matters because we will eventually deal with this with someone that we know, we love, and we care about. Now, in the middle of a difficult and kind of sensitive Subject, there is some really, really good news. This good news is why I'm an all-in follower of Jesus. Because what I know to be true about Jesus is Jesus never stigmatized or shamed people. And if Jesus never stigmatized or shamed people, then neither should his followers stigmatize and shame people. We should have compassion and love just like Jesus did for us. And it gets better. God doesn't leave you and I guessing or even the world guessing on how we should respond to any kind of illness, whether it be mental, physical, emotional, or spiritual. What I love is that God doesn't leave us guessing, that God gives us the Bible. And in the Bible, God gives us a couple principles as we address this. So what I'd like to do today is something just really simple. I wanna look at a couple of verses that identify some biblical principles from the beginning to the end of the Bible, and that these biblical ideas and principles should then frame our view around wellness, whether it be physical wellness or mental wellness, whether it's around physical illness or mental illness. And then that, as we change our view, when we encounter people who are dealing with mental health issues or mental health disorders or mental health is issue, um, illness, our response will not be one of stigma and shame but one of compassion and support. And so one of the first scriptures that I'd like to look at, this kind of first idea in scripture comes from Psalm 139 and it's this. I'm gonna put it up on the screen. For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And you might be asking, well, Matt, what does this verse, what, why does God have in this Bible and what in the world does this have to do with wellness or health or illness? And what I love about it is the author is letting us know a truth that Jesus later confirms, is that while we have a shell of flesh, that we have an innermost or inner being on the inside, that this flesh suit that we wear also houses something called our spirit and our mind, that we have an innermost being. And I love, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. One translation says it this way, says, I thank you because we are complex. And here's the idea, is that we are not just physical beings, we have an inner being, and that as humans, we are complex. And we're gonna get to what that principle applies to. The next verse I think is so beautiful. You see, Jesus is hanging out with his disciples and they run into someone who is not well. Matter of fact, they have a physical illness. And they ask Jesus an odd question. We find this in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of John, John 9, 2, and 3. And so Jesus' disciple asked Jesus a question. They said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now I need to stop here. The disciples 
the Jewish people and the religious thought of the day was this, that if you are sick and if you suffer, you deserve it because you sinned. That was the theological idea of the day. And I want you to know that Jesus came to let his disciples, the religious leaders, and the world know that just because you are sick and just because you are suffering doesn't mean you earned it. And so here's what Jesus responds. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Now, Jesus isn't saying that this guy never sinned or his parents never sinned. What he is saying is his illness or sickness wasn't a result of something that he did and he earned this illness. And I just need to stop and I need to grab church folk. Listen, if you're here and you didn't grow up in church or maybe you're not a follower of Jesus, like you just can eat some popcorn and watch, but I need to tell the church needs to stop with this idea that anyone who is suffering and anyone who's sick has earned it because they got it wrong. We all get it wrong. But disease and sickness and suffering is a part of living in a busted and broken world. And then there's this encounter that the Apostle Paul, now I need to give you a little background about the Apostle Paul. He used to persecute Christians until he had an encounter with a risen Jesus. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul wrote a large section of the New Testament. Matter of fact, when historians, about a decade ago, there was this book put together and they asked historians to vote, who are the most influential people in all of history? The Apostle Paul was number two. Historians said the Apostle Paul, who took the message of Jesus, all the different parts of, of the world, was one of the most influential people in all of history, right? Number two. And we pick up and reveal and see something when this Apostle Paul writes a group of Christ followers to a church in Galatia. In Galatians, um, we're going to put it up on the screen, Galatians 4, and it says this. As you know, it was because of an illness. What? Hold on. Paul, are you saying that you, you had an illness, that you were sick? As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with, maybe you just want to type in the chat, with scorn. There was no stigma and there was no shame. You did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me. Wouldn't it be awesome that if the church, when people were dealing with illness, whether it was physical or mental illness, or physical disorders, or mental disorders, or physical health, or mental health, instead of giving them contempt or scorn, we welcomed them. Now I want to stop and ask the religious folk a question. The Apostle Paul, who wrote large sections of the New Testament, who God actually called and had like a personal visit with, who was actually filled with the Holy Spirit and who was a missionary on his purpose, yet he had an illness. And it leads us to three truths that we discover, these kind of three principles, and I want to put them up on the screen, and it's this. There's an inner you, and you are complex. Remember when we debunked all the mental health myths, myths back in week one? And if you missed it, you can go into our YouTube channel or into website. I encourage you, if you missed it, to go back there. But here's the truth, that when you and I deny a person's complexity, we dehumanize them. There's an inner you, and you are complex. That's why when we went through those lists of things, Things like eating disorders and bipolar and schizophrenia and anxiety and depression and PTSD, that there are complex things. There's an inner us and we're complex and that's okay. We just need to admit it, right? Jesus said to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and all your mind. God says that we are physical, we are spiritual, we are emotional and we are mental beings, that we are complex beings. And then I love this truth. Illness isn't earned. I want to stop right there and make sure that we all get this. That just because we're sick or suffering doesn't mean that we deserved it or we earned it or there's some sin that God is paying us back for. Now, I'm not saying that, that there are people who've never sinned. The only one who's never sinned is Jesus. But listen, illness isn't earned. And then I love this, illness doesn't discount or disqualify us from God's purposes or love. Think about that. 
The Apostle Paul had an illness. He even prayed about it, but the illness didn't go away. And Paul didn't lack faith. Paul wasn't like some in hidden sin. God actually had purpose and a plan. His illness didn't disqualify it. Isn't that amazing? If we could grab hold of these truths and apply them to our view when it comes to mental health. Maybe when we run into those that we care about and those that God cares about when it comes to mental health, mental disorders, and mental illness, that our view will lead to one of compassion, care, and support, and not stigma, silence, and shame. So the hope today is that we will undo and kind of broaden our view about illness and disorders and health and our mental wellness and well-being. However, to dis demystify mental health, right, and, and to kind of undo kind of a long-standing thought process about stigma and shame and, and kind of silence around that, we may have to face some uncomfortable truths about some ideas that maybe we were brought up with or maybe the culture's taught us and we didn't even know it. Now, before you bail, I wanna ask a favor. Before you bail and kind of go, listen, um, that's not me. Like, I don't think that way. I want you to ask, and I want ourselves to ask this question. Is it possible? Is it possible that some of the ideas that we're going to need to undo today have crept into how we think and treat people when it comes to mental health and mental disorders and mental illness? So those three truths that I think are in the Bible, the first one that we need to undo, this first view that I think those principles help us undo, it's this right here. We need to undo a lack of understanding. You see, here's what I discovered. There's some confusion about the mental health spectrum that creates unfair reaction and unhealthy expectations. See, I think that most of us have kind of a fuzzy idea about kind of the mental health spectrum of like, hey, that like we all might do this and that some may do this and that there are a few people that deal with this and there's kind of this, this spectrum of where people fall in the mental wellness, just like in the physical wellness, people fall in different places. We kind of get that idea, but I think because we confuse that spectrum that we will often have unfair expectations and unfair reactions and unhealthy expectations and reactions because we don't see this clearly. And so what I'd like to do today is just kind of give us a quick run through. And again, I'm not a clinical psychiatrist or psychologist. I'm not a clinical counselor. I'm gonna use some of these terms loosely and I'm gonna kind of explain what they are. I'm gonna put them up on the screen as this. Mental health, mental disorder, and mental illness. And I use disorders and mental illness not based on like how severe they are, more just on their chronic. So mental health is like, hey, that's something that all of us deal with. Listen, every single human being on the planet, in every country, on every continent, in every economic standing, every kind of language, every skin color, every single person has to deal with mental health. All of us will have to process grief, pain, disappointment, sadness, joy, happiness, um, things that we like are excited about, like all of us have to navigate. There'll be times where we feel lethargic. There'll be times where we're, we're sad. Like all of us will have to navigate some mental health. And here's what might be shocking. And again, not on severity, but just on kind of length of time. Here's what I've discovered through almost 25 years of, of working with people. And what the science tells us is that almost every single person, very few people make it from birth to death without facing some mental disorder. The truth is, is that almost every single person watching and listening at some point in their life either has or will experience a mental disorder. And it will come through various different ways. It might be through the trauma of something like a divorce. It might come through the environment of that you were in this job, this career for 20 years, and all of a sudden you, your company folds and it creates this financial impact in your family and there's stress and there's things and you might experience it. It might actually happen through like a pregnancy or some hormonal thing. I wish someone would have told me that my wife could struggle with um, 
um, what do they call it, postpartum depression. Like that sometimes your body, as we age, things can happen. We can experience trauma, the loss of a family member. As we age, the biochemistry of our body changes. Did you know that I actually believe that just like, you know what, most people go to the ER once in their life, not because they're bad, but because as we go through life, at some point, something's gonna break. And if it's true of our bodies, is it possible that none of us will make it through all of our life without facing something that would create a mental disorder where we should go and get help? Listen, if I fell down and busted my eye open and needed stitches or broke my uh, arm and there's a bone sticking through, I would want you to pray for me and I'd want you to support me, but I would go to someone who knows what they're doing to help me get well. So first of all, the spectrum is all of us have to deal with mental health. Mental disorder, I would suggest that all of us at some point, and it might not be going on for the rest of our life, but there may be a section or a season of our life where most of us will experience a disorder. And then some will experience mental illness. Whether again, it's due to those things that I said, there might be a physical malfunction or a physiological imbalance. It could be trauma or environment or any other reason. But there are some people who will have chronic mental illness. They may have been born with it. It may have happened because of something, but it is something that they won't get rid of this side of eternity. And I wanna remind people of what we said in week one. It is not a failure of faith. It is not some spiritual formation that they need to re read or pray for. It is not a weakness issue. It is a illness issue. And so there's this spectrum. And the truth is, is that each and every single person and different seasons of life will fall on the spectrum. And you might be saying, well, why do we have to do, undo the kind of the, the lack of understanding about the spectrum? Well, that's a really good question and I want to answer it. And here's where the lack of understanding comes in. And I don't mean to be offensive, but maybe you can stick with me. Just go back to one. Right there. See, we all deal with mental health, right? Like we all deal with mental health. And so because we all deal with mental health, right? Because we deal with sadness, because we deal with feeling lethargic, because we deal with disappointment, because we deal with things that we like and we go, oh, I have to say no to that. Because all of us deal with mental health, we think our experience with our mental health gives us the right and ability to judge and to speak into things that we either haven't experienced or won't experience in other people's life. Let me say that one more time. Because all of us deal with mental health and we go, oh, well, because I experienced sadness or because I experienced this thing, then I am now someone who can speak into my expectation and give you my advice about mental disorders and mental illness with no training and no understanding of who people are and because of a lack of understanding, oftentimes both people in culture and in church, because they don't understand this, will speak into things that they shouldn't. Let me give you a story, an example of this in everyday life that I've experienced as a pastor. As a pastor, I've had both the unfortunate and kind of the, uh, the blessing of doing funerals. And you might be saying, you know, that sounds unfortunate. I've gotten to see the beauty of, of amazing lives. But I've been at funerals where people have said the most inappropriate, harmful things that you could ever say at a funeral. There was this funeral where an adult had lost their child. And so anytime a parent loses a child and you have to do a funeral, it is, it is hard, it is horrible, it is painful, they're, 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 it is just sad, like it's, it's just hard. It's one of those why questions we don't get answered this side of eternity. But in one of these funerals, someone who had lost a child had someone who came up to comfort them. And in the kind of oddity and the, the desire to be helpful and the inability to understand where this person was, this friend spoke to the person who had lost their child and said, I know what you're going through, we lost our pet and our pet was like our child. Can you, can you grasp that? That at a funeral, someone told a parent who lost a child that they lost a pet and so that they know what they're going through. And you might be cringing. I hope you're cringing on the other side of the screen. 
and going, I would never do something like that. And here's my thing. I wonder how many of us do that when it comes to mental health. Because we've had a few things in mental health, we assume that we know what someone with a mental disorder or a mental illness is going through, and we will walk up and speak into things in such a cringeworthy way. We need to undo kind of our this lack of understanding of like, just because we deal with mental health doesn't mean that we've encountered a disorder or a mental illness in the magnitude or the scope or the scale that someone else has them. Which leads us to the second thing that we need to undo, and I'm gonna put up on the screen is this. We need to undo our double standards. Now, when I got to this point, I need to be careful because this thing makes me angry. It makes me so angry that I wanna cuss, and I was like, hey, Pastor Matt, you can't do that on the camera because using a different standard for physical health than mental health is not only hypocrisy, it's prejudice. I wanna stop and I want that to sink into every person who is listening and watching. When we in culture or we in the church use a different standard for physical health than we do for mental health, it's not just hypocrisy, that is outright prejudice and it is wrong and it is harmful. I mean, think about this. When someone gets an Alzheimer's like diagnosis, you know what we say, we go, man, that's a bummer, the world is broken. When someone gets a cancer diagnosis, we go, man, that's a bummer, the world is broken. When someone goes, hey, listen, I have diabetes and I'm gonna have to be insulin for the rest of my life, we go, man, that's a bummer, life is broken. When someone says, listen, I, I have MS or I have some other kind of chronic disease that I didn't expect and it's gonna impact the rest of my life, you know what we say when it comes to physical illness? We go, bummer, that's a broken world. When someone says, I have a bipolar disorder, I struggle and deal with schizophrenia, I've been diagnosed with clinical depression, you know what we do? We don't say, bummer, the world's broken. We judge them and say, you're weak, you should get yourself fixed. That's not only hypocrisy, it's prejudice. And you know how I know this to be true both in culture and in the church? Now I'm gonna stop. Now I don't mean to offend anyone that's had any kind of surgery to improve their life, but can we be really honest here for a second, right? Like, like I just wanna stop, like I need you to like, we're just gonna be, be truthful here. I've had friends, good friends who are good people, have hip replacements. I've had really good friends who've had knee replacements. I've had really good friends who've had stints and work done on their heart. Now, as much as I love my friends who've had hip replacements and knee replacements and stints in the hearts, and they didn't deserve any of those things. But is it possible that when we go, man, I'm so glad you went to the doctor. I'm so glad that you went to go get chemo. I'm so glad that you medical technology allows you to get a new knee. Is it possible that some of those people that got that work in surgery, maybe it was because of some lifestyle issues. And here's what I mean. I've had good friends who've had knee replacement. They're like, hey, when I was in sports and I was younger, I messed up my knees. And so when I got old, I had to have knee replacements. I go, that's true. But is it also possible that those people as they got older didn't exercise and maybe were a little bit overweight and the stress on their knees wasn't just because of their injury, it's because they didn't take care of themselves. But yet when they go to the doctor and they get a knee replacement, we'll pray for them and we'll say, I'm sorry. And we're glad for modern technology. But as soon as someone says, I struggle with an eating disorder, I'm bulimic, or I hurt myself, or I struggle with depression, or I have schizophrenia, our thing isn't like, oh my gosh, how do we help you? How do we support you? How do we make sure you get medicine? We have a different standard for those who struggle with physical illness over those who struggle with mental illness. Now, that's in culture. The church, we're worse. We're way worse. And I'm going to rat on my industry, the pastor industry. And so here's where the hypocrisy turns into prejudice. And anyone that has grown up, I wanna to look to anyone here who may struggle with a mental issue in the future or has in the past or is now, any church that says it's because you sinned and you're unworthy and you're weak is lying. Did you know they recently did a survey and it was recently, it was probably a couple years ago about pastors and you know what they discovered? Roughly 71% to over 75% of pastors in America 
are overweight and obese. And we know that overweight and obese leads to heart issues. It leads to all kinds of other issues. I wonder how many pastors who, who kind of judge or continue to pass on stigma and shame and silence to mental health issues are on like blood thinners or on maybe other medicines and because of things that they do, yet their health issue isn't a crisis of faith. And so what we need to do is we need to undo the double standards. I knew this would be really popular. Maybe I can just get an amen in the chat. Because our double standard when it comes to physical illness and mental illness is not just hypocrisy, it's prejudice. Do you remember the verse that I share? Jesus said it was neither the parents nor them that sinned. Do you remember the verse I shared about the apostle Paul who had an illness? God had a call. He met God face to face, right? He met Jesus face to face. He had a call, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He helped to write the Bible, yet he had an illness. It wasn't a spiritual issue, it was an illness issue. Can we please undo the double standard when it comes to the stigma, silence, and shame around mental illness? And here's the third one. Now, before we get to the third one, I want us to pause. The third one, none of us are gonna like. As I wrote the third view that we need to undo, I went, ooh, people are gonna wanna run. I don't like this and you're not gonna like it, but we have to address it. And here's the third thing we have to undo. We have to undo our hidden pride. A diagnosis never defines a person's worth or dignity. Someone with Down syndrome or autism or any physical disability is not a less than human. You know that and I know that. Anyone who gets a physical illness diagnosis of cancer or ALS or any other thing, cystic fibrosis, when someone gets a physical diagnosis, we don't go, oh, you are a less than person. You're you're not worthy of dignity. Why in the world would we take away people's dignity when it comes to mental illness? And you, you might be going, well, I don't think we do that. And I would go, well, then why is there so much stigma, silence, and shame around mental health? And here's why. And I discovered, unfortunately, that sometimes this lives in my heart. And so it's not just you, I deal with it. Nope, go back. I I, I understand that this lives in my heart, and here's what it is. If that was me, I would be better and stronger. Let me say that one more time. See, the hidden pride is, well, if I had that mental health issue, if I had that mental health disability, if I had that mental illness, I would be stronger and I would do better than them. If I was in their shoes, I would do differently, and that is the thing of pride. If I was their personality, if I had their experience, if I was exactly the way that God made them, I would do differently and be better and be stronger because inherently there's something better about me than them. And you know how I know this is true? Did you know the number one cause of homelessness in America is mental health? Yet I see so many people drive by and talk about homeless people like they're just lazy or they don't care or they won't work. Did you know the second leading cause of death in America for 10-year-olds to 34-year-olds? Listen, I need you to listen in and focus. The second leading cause of death after accidents for 10-year-olds to 34-year-olds is suicide. Can we stop calling it weakness and start calling it what it is? It is illness. And to say that we would do better or we would be stronger at the end of the day is nothing but pride a true but embarrassing story about me. And this, is, this happened, oh, years, years, decades and decades ago. I had run into this pastor, and this pastor, he was awesome. Matter of fact, I hope to be as awesome as this pastor is someday. I mean, there was so much about this pastor that I just thought was amazing and great. And I said, hope, if I can just be half of that person, I'll be an amazing pastor. But there was one thing about this pastor that I realized that I said, there's so many good things, but there's this one thing that I don't want to be like them. You see, this pastor, it seemed like they were kind of coasting in their church and kind of in their career. And I thought, you know what? I don't ever want to be like that. What happened that caused that person to coast in that season of their life? And I said these words. I said, well, I'll never be like that because I had some hidden pride that says, well, if I was them, I would do better and it would be stronger. And as the decades of friendship went on, I realized that there was a story of that person wasn't coasting, they were surviving. And when I became a pastor, 
And I went through decades of being a pastor. I hit a patch where if someone on the outside looked at me, they probably would have said the same thing. Oh, he's coasting. I was just surviving. And the reality is that a diagnosis should never define a person's worth or dignity. People with mental health issues, mental disorders, and mental illness do not need my pity or your pity. They just need to be seen as human beings made in the image of God, worthy of the dignity that we would give anyone. So if I was gonna sum up the whole message, these views that we need to undo, I would say it this way, and I'm gonna put it up on the screen. Treating anyone with any kind of illness, so whether it's physical or mental or emotional or spiritual, treating anyone with any kind of illness with shame instead of compassion and care is a sickness that keeps the world a busted place. Did you catch that? When someone is sick, when someone is suffering, when someone is struggling, and our response is stigma, silence, and shame, it's we not they who are way more sick. Because if we can't give care and compassion and support to those who are hurting, maybe there's a sickness in us that is greater than the illness that they're dealing with. Which leads me to a summation for South Point and for churches. I believe this is what God is calling us to, and it's this right here. It says this, loving like Jesus loved us. I mean, that was Jesus' command at the Last Supper. Love one another the way I've loved you, right? Loving like Jesus loved us means we will not treat others, whether they believe like us, vote like us, look like us, think like us, agree with us. That means we will not treat others with ignorance, fear, or pride. So, I wanna close with a true story that happened to me decades ago. I, my body got really sick, and I was really sad because I went to the ER. I had almost six foot tall, I was about 170 pounds, I exercised pretty regularly, but I got so sick that I lost a bunch of weight. I was down into the 130s and 120s as a almost six foot healthy man, right? And so I went to the ER and I said, listen, I'm, I'm like, I'm just bleeding, I'm, I, I can't eat, I'm like, my bot, something's wrong in my body. So they asked me a bunch of questions. I go, no, I haven't been out of the country. No, I didn't eat seafood. They asked me. So they gave me this medicine. They sent me home. For the next six weeks, I got worse and worse and worse and worse to where the only thing I could eat in the day was an apple in the morning and a sweet potato at night. Finally, I got a doctor to see me. And when the doctor saw me, they just shook their head and they said, I'm, I'm so sorry. You are not weak. You are sick. And so they took a bunch of tests, and as they left, they could tell I was just hurting. They said, hey, do you need me to do this? They said, could you just turn the lights off, and I'm just going to curl up and just try to make it through. So the doctor went out and came back and said, hey, I think um, after looking at you professionally, um, kind of some of your symptoms, I think this is the diagnosis I would give you, and I'm going to give you some medication that will really help you. And I'm going, why have I been sick for six weeks and no one recommended this medication? And he said, I'm really sorry. He goes, the reason why they don't prescribe it is we call it the divorce drug, and if you talk to my kids and my wife, they'll go, yeah, man, like it's harsh, right? And he goes, do, do you want me to write a prescription uh, for your supervisor because you need to take some time off of work? And I said, don't worry, I know the boss really well. And here's what I discovered is I went to a professional who could help me figure out what was going wrong. And then this professional realized that my body wasn't working and that I needed some medicine so that I could function in life and that I should get some rest. And what I loved about what my physician said is, is that you are not weak you have an illness. I want everyone who hears this and sees this to know that if you are struggling with mental health, a mental disorder, or mental illness, you are not weak. You have an illness. It's okay to get help. As a matter of fact, at South Point, we don't want to just talk about that. We want to actually provide some resources. So on the next slide, we have this here. We have a crisis hotline. Listen, if anything I've talked about today is it just overwhelms you, there is no one on staff at South Point that is a professional counselor. So even if you called us or texted us, we'd be the wrong people. So we want to give you the national crisis hotline. It's up on the screen. We also, if you're going through something and need someone to talk to and go, I don't know where to go to or how to get help, we, you can go to South Point for you. Uh, dot com slash time to talk and you can set up a time to talk to one of the pastoral staff and we can kind of go listen we'll hear your story and go what are the resources that we can help you 
engage in. And we'll pay for a couple of sessions of counseling. We have Stevens Ministry. We have all these other things that we can connect you to to help you take steps in wellness. And in a couple of weeks, we're gonna have some professional counselors on. So if you have any questions about mental health or mental disorders or mental illness, please, you can send them in the church office. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna have kind of a round table of counselors and we're gonna answer those. I wanna leave you with just two challenges. I said in the beginning that every single person, regardless of where you're at with faith, will know and care for someone who deals with mental health. Here's my two things. Would you take out a sticky note and if there's someone you know personally that is dealing with a mental health issue, would you write their name and put it on the mirror in a place that only you can see it? Maybe it's in your bathroom, maybe it's in your bedroom, maybe it's on the dashboard of your car, but would you do that today? And then every day this week, would you just, do, would you just pray for them? Pray that God would meet them. Pray that they would, they would have the strength and be wise enough to take health steps because getting help is wise, not Week, would you just pray for them? And then here's the second thing. If you do know somebody, whether it's a family member, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, would you maybe make space to see them and listen? Maybe take them out for a cup of coffee or a meal. Not to tell them any ideas or suggestions or your stories, but to listen and see and let them know that you made space to see them because all people matter deeply to God and that we should love and care for people, that the church should be leading the way to undo the stigma, silence, and shame so that the world and the church would be a place when people deal with any kind of illness, but specifically mental illness or mental disorders or mental health, that there would be compassion, care, and support. Hey, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that Jesus never stigmatized or shamed people, that Jesus was full of grace in truth and in that order. God, thank you for using the Apostle Paul to remind us that you can have an illness and that doesn't discount you or disqualify you from purpose and from love. God, thank you for the words of Jesus that remind us that sickness and suffering isn't always because we did something wrong and that as our heavenly Father, the empty tomb that we get to celebrate in a couple weeks reminds us that there's a healing on the other side of eternity, that all the busedness and the brokenness in this world will be fixed because you are a good Father who loves us. God, may we, your followers, do what Jesus did, that we would never use the tools of stigma or shame, but of grace and compassion and care, that we would love the way that you loved us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And never forget, you matter deeply to God.